Chapter 5 The sixth sumptuous hour of the fifteenth glorious day of the yearly Kanchen Sector Conference now begins, the herald intoned, his deep voice echoing across the bowl-shaped field where the various delegates sat, squatted, lay, or crouched, according to their species' particular physiological design. Let us all hail and magnify the grandiose elector of Patrick Major, and bid him express his sublime and all-encompassing wisdom in his leading of this gathering. The assembled beings called or growled their agreements with the herald's sentiment. All but Han, and lounging beside him on the feathery mat grass, lay ahead to smile in private amusement. Coming out here had been Han's idea, after all a temporary respite from the bitter dissension and the gnawing suspicions that had been churning through the New Republic government ever since that partially destroyed copy of the Kamas document had come to light. And it had been a good idea, too. In the half-day since their arrival, Leia had already begun to feel the tension draining out of her. Getting away from Coruscant was exactly what she'd needed, and she'd taken great pains to mention that to her husband at least twice now, and to thank him for his thoughtfulness. At the moment, unfortunately, all their reassurances were falling on deaf ears. Once again, Han had failed to take into account what Leia privately referred to as the solo embarrassment factor. And let us similarly hail and magnify our glorious visitors from the New Republic, the Herald continued, waving his hand in an expansive gesture towards where Han and Leia were stretched out. May their sublime wisdom, awesome courage, and magnificent honor enlighten the sky above our gathering. You forgot her uplifted eyebrows, Han muttered under his breath as the assembly roared out their greetings. It's better than Coruscant, Leia chided him gently as she half rose and waved. Come on, Han, be nice. I'm waving, I'm waving, Han grumbled leaning up on one arm and waving reluctantly with the other. I don't know why we have to do this every hour. Would you rather have people accusing us of helping cover up attempted genocide, Leia countered. I'd rather they just left us alone, Han said, giving one last wave and then dropping his hand back down. Leia lowered hers as well, and the approving roar of the delegates died away. Patience, dear, Leia said, as the herald bowed deeply and yielded the podium to the elaborately dressed grandiose elector. It's only for the rest of the day. You can put up with it that long. Tomorrow we'll head over to Patrick Minor and get all that peace and quiet you promised me. It just better be real peaceful and quiet, Han warned, looking around at the crowd of delegates. It will be, Leia assured him, reaching over to squeeze his hand. They may be all pomp and pageantry here on Patrick Major, but over there among the tall grain farms we probably won't find anyone who even recognizes us. Han snorted, and even as he did, Leia could sense a lightening of his mood. Yeah, he said. We'll see. Carib? With a wince of tired knees, Carib Devast got up from where he'd been crouching, careful not to bump into either of the two rows of tall grain pressing close around him. I'm over here, Sabman, he called, waving his coring tool as high over the stalks as he could reach. I see you, Sabman called back. There was the crackle of brittle leaves being brushed against, and then Sabman emerged through a gap in the row. I had to come right... He broke off, frowning at the tool in Carib's hand. Uh-oh. Save the uh-ohs for polite company, Carib said sourly. Just say shove it and mean it. Sabman hissed softly between his teeth. How many colonies, he asked. So far, just this one, Carib said, waving the corer towards the tall grain stock he'd been digging into. And I did find an empress, so it's possible I got the whole infestation, but I wouldn't bet money on it. I'll alert the others, Sabman said. Probably should get word to the Tri-Valley Coordinator, too, in case this isn't the only valley the bugs are moving into. Yeah. Carib eyed his brother. Now what wonderful news have you brought me? Sabman's lips compressed. We just got confirmation from Bastion, he said quietly. 
New Republic High Counselor Leo Organa Solo is definitely over on Patrick Major, and the attack owner is definitely on. Reflexively, Carib glanced up at the half-lit planet hanging in the sky overhead. They must be crazy, he said. Attack a New Republic High Counselor just like that? I don't think they really cared who they got to attack, as long as it was a New Republic official, Sabin said. Apparently, the grandiose elector sent out a blanket invitation to Coruscant asking for, uh, for a representative. My guess is that the request was prodded by some imperial plant, with an eye to the fact that we were already in place here and could act as backup. It was just luck that Gaversom decided to send Organa Solo. Yeah, Carib said darkly. Luck. Did this come over Grand Admiral Thrawn's personal authorization? I don't know, Sabin said. The notice didn't say. But it has to have come from him, doesn't it? I mean, if he's in command, then he's in command. I suppose so, Carib conceded reluctantly. So there it was. The war was about to be brought suddenly and violently to the Patrick systems, right to their doorstep. And the long wait was over. The quiet existence of Imperial sleeper cell Genth 44 was about to come to an end. You say we're the backup. Who's the primary? I don't know, Sabin said. Some tag team in from Bastion for the occasion, I'd guess. And when is it supposed to happen? Tomorrow, Sabin said. Organa Solo and her husband are supposed to be coming over here to Minor once the conference breaks up. And there's no indication whether the attack is real or just supposed to look real. Sabin gave him a startled look an expression that quickly turned knowing and thoughtful. Interesting point, he said. With Thrawn involved, you can't take anything for granted, can you? No. All I know is that there's an attack coming and that we're supposed to stand ready in case Solo's better or luckier than expected. Carib grimaced. I suppose even Solo's luck has to run out sooner or later. Yeah. Sam eyed him suspiciously. What are you thinking? Carrig looked up at the sky again. I'm thinking we have to play this by ear, he said quietly. One thing's for sure, though. If the battle comes anywhere near our valley, no matter who's winning, we're definitely not going to just sit by and watch. We've invested too much here to let it go without a fight. Sabin nodded. Understood, he said soberly. I'll pass the word to the others. Whatever happens tomorrow, we'll be ready. Ahead, through the alien greenery, a stand of gnarled trees brushed past the screen to Pelion's left, and the Adat simulator bucked to the right in response. Watch those trees, Admiral, Major Rain's voice warned in his helmet headphones. You probably won't knock yourself over that way, but I've seen walkers get hung up so bad you had to send a couple of troopers down to blow the tree off at the roots. Takes time, and you're a sitting flink until you get free. Acknowledged, Pelion said, easing over away from the trees. Simulated that at combat, frustrating the rating though it could be sometimes, was far enough outside his normal command duties that it was actually a form of relaxation for him. Though, of course, nothing that included combat was ever truly outside a Supreme Commander's duties. The better Pelion understood how mechanized equipment handled on difficult terrain, the better he would know how to deploy them in future operations. Assuming, of course, the Empire ever again had occasion to launch ground assaults. Firmly, he shook the thought away. One of the reasons for coming down here, after all, had been to distract himself from the continued and frustrating lack of response to his peace offer on the New Republic's part. He was past the stand of trees now. Easing back on his speed, he keyed for a side view to see how range was handling the jungle. Very straightforwardly, actually. Keeping an eye farther ahead than Pelion was doing, he was using his forward laser cannon to cut down potential obstacles well before they had become a problem. A fairly noisy technique, of course, and one that gave any enemies that much more advanced warning. On the other hand, adats were hardly the weapon of choice where stealth was required, and Rain's method was definitely moving him through the jungle faster than Pelion. Lifting his gaze, trying to stifle the reflexive impulse to watch where his adat was about to step, he squeezed off a few tentative shots. That's the way, Admiral, Rain said approvingly. 
Just try to anticipate where the trouble's going to be before you're too close to aim the guns, whether they can do you any good. Pelion grunted. Better yet, avoid using adats entirely in this situation. Whenever we can, Rain said. Unfortunately, troublemakers like to hide themselves in places like this and then put up energy shields over their heads. Besides, there's nothing like an adat clumping through the trees to scare the sneer off someone's face. There was a click from the headset. Admiral, this is Ardiff, the Chimera's captain voice came. Lieutenant Mavron is on his way in. There was the briefest of pauses. He reports, sir, that he has a vector. Pelion felt his eyes narrow. Mavron's mission had been a long shot, one last attempt to find out something about the force that had hit them six days ago. If he said he'd found a vector... Have him report to Ready Room 14 as soon as he docks, he instructed Ardiff, shutting off the simulator. I'll meet you there. Ardiff was waiting alone in the Ready Room when Pelion arrived. I assumed this was to be a private meeting, so I cleared the other pilots out, he explained. Is this about that holonet search? I hope so, Pelion said, waving him to one of the chairs around the central monitor table and sitting down himself. Ah. Lieutenant, he added as the door slid open and Maverin stepped inside. Welcome home. A vector, you said. Yes, sir, Maverin said, setting a data pad down on the monitor table and easing himself into a chair with the peculiar stiffness of a man who has been sitting in the Starfighter cockpit for too long. The Holonet relay at Horska did indeed still have their records for transmissions from this area just after that raid against us. You were able to pull them all, I presume, Pelion asked, picking up the data pad. Yes, sir, Maverin said. Unfortunately, I couldn't get any names, but I did get endpoints for the transmissions. He nodded towards the data pad. I took the liberty of sifting through them on the way back. The one I marked struck me as the most interesting. Pelion felt his jaw tighten as he found the lieutenant's mark. Bastion. Ardiff rumbled deep in his throat. So it was an Imperial behind that attack. There's more, Maverin said. The original endpoint was Bastion, but then it got relayed a few more times and wound up somewhere in the Kruktar system. Kruktar system, Ardiff said, frowning. That's deep in New Republic territory. What would someone from Bastion be doing there? I wondered that too, Maverin said, his voice suddenly grim. So I stopped off at Carusto on the way back here and pulled a copy of the Trinebulon for that day. If the timings are correct, a few hours after that transmission, the unified factions of Croctar announced that a treaty had been negotiated between themselves and the Empire. The mediator of record. Well, according to Lord Superior Boshimi, it was Grand Admiral Thrawn. An icy chill ran up Pelion's back. That's impossible, he said his voice sounding strange in his ears. Thrawn is dead. I watched him die. Yes, sir, Maverin said, nodding. But according to the report, I watched him die, Pelion thundered. The sudden outburst surprised even him. It certainly startled Ardiff and Maverin. Yes, sir, we know, Ardiff said. Obviously, it's some kind of trick. L Lieutenant, I imagine the rest can wait until you file your complete report. Why don't you go get yourself cleaned up? Thank you, sir, uh, Maverin said, clearly glad to be given the opportunity to escape. I'll have my report filed within an hour. Very good, Ardiff nodded. Dismissed. He waited until Maverin had gone and the door was once again closed before speaking. It is a trick, Admiral, he said to Pelion. It has to be. With an effort, Pelion pulled his thoughts back from the memories of that awful day at Bilbringi. The day the Empire had finally and irrevocably died. Yes, he murmured. But what if it's not? What if Thrawn really is still alive? Why, in that case... Ardiff trailed off, his forehead wrinkled in sudden uncertainty. Exactly, Pelion said, nodding. The time when Thrawn's tactical genius could have been in the use to us was when? Five years ago? Seven? Ten? 
What could he possibly do now except bring the New Republic down on us in panic? I don't know, sir. Ardith paused. But that's not what's really bothering you. Pelion looked down at his hands. Old hands, gnarled with age and darkened by the sunlight of a thousand worlds. I was with Thrawn for just over a year, he told Ardith. I was his senior fleet officer, his student. He hesitated. Perhaps even his confidant. I'm not sure. The point is that he chose the Chimera and me when he returned from the Unknown Regions. He didn't just pick us at random. He chose us. No, there wasn't much Thrawn did at random, Ardiff agreed. From which it follows that if he's back, then he's chosen someone else. Pelion finished the other's sentence, the words a sharp ache in his heart. And there can be only a very few reasons why he would do that. It can't be position, Ardiff said firmly. You are Supreme Commander, after all. And it certainly can't be competence. What's left? Vision, perhaps, Pelion suggested, tapping the data pad gently with a fingertip. This peace proposal was my idea, you know. I came up with it. I argued for it, and I crammed it down the Moff's throats. Moff Disra was one of those who loudly and strongly opposed it. Moff Disra, Bastion. Coincidence? For a moment, Ardiff was silent. All right, he said. Even if we grant all that, which I don't, by the way, why send a pirate or mercenary group out here to attack us? Why not simply come here and tell you directly that the treaty idea is off? I don't know, Pelion said. Perhaps it isn't off. Perhaps this is exactly where Thrawn wants me to be. Either preparing to talk to Bella Bliss for whatever reason, or else... He pursed his lips. Or else simply out of his way, where I can't interfere with whatever he's planning. The silence this time stretched out painfully. I don't believe he would do that to you, sir, Ardiff said at last. But the words carried no genuine conviction that Pelion could hear. Not after all you went through together. You don't believe that any more than I do, Pelion said quietly. Thrawn wasn't human, you know, no matter how human he might have looked. He was an alien, with alien thoughts and purposes and agendas. Perhaps I was never more to him than just one more tool he could use in reaching his goal. Whatever that goal was. Almost hesitantly, Ardiff reached over and touched Pelion's arm. It's been a long road, sir, he said. Long and hard and discouraging. For all of us. But mostly for you. If there's anything I can do... Pelion forced a smile. Thank you, Captain. Don't worry. I'm not going to give up. Not until I've seen this through. We're staying here, then? Ardiff asked. For a few more days, Pelion said. I want to give Bella Bliss every possible chance. And if he doesn't show... Whether he does or not, we'll be going to Bastion next, Pelion said, hearing a touch of grimness in his voice. For this and other matters, Moff Disra has some explaining to do. Yes, sir, Ardiff said, standing up. We'll hope that this whole throne appearance is just some trick of his. We most certainly will not, Pelion reproved him mildly. Thrawn's return would revitalize our people and bring nothing but good to the Empire. I would never want it said that I valued my own pride above that. Ardiff colored slightly. No, sir, of course not. My apologies, Admiral. No apologies necessary, Captain, Pelion assured him, getting to his feet. As you said, it's been a long, hard road. But it's nearly over. One way or another, it's nearly over. The entry procedures at the Drevstarn spaceport were considerably tighter today than they'd been the last time Dren Navid had landed here on the Botham homeworld. Hardly surprising, considering the events of the past five days. With the surprise Larazan attack against their orbital manufacturing plant and the subsequent multi-species military buildup in the sky overhead, Tensions were growing at a rapid and eminently satisfying pace. 
and the Bothans' normally business-friendly procedures had suffered as a result. Once little more than a formality, exit from the spaceport quarantine area now required a complete ID check and cargo scan. Not that that mattered to Navit. This time, though, there was nothing in his cargo that would raise even a paranoid Bothan's fur, and his ID was as perfect as only Imperial intelligence could make them. Your identification and personal effects appear to be in order, the Bothan customs official said, after the 15-minute procedure that seemed to be the norm today. However, the importation department will have to run further tests on your animals before they can be allowed into the city proper. Sure, no problem, Navit said, waving his hand in one of the expansive gestures typical of the uh, Batrisley district on Fedgy, where his ID claimed he'd been born. He had no idea whether the Bothan would notice subtleties of that sort, but the first law of infiltration was to wear a roll the way a stormtrooper wore his armor. Hey, I've done this on dozens of planets, he added. I know how this quarantine thing works. The Bothan's fur rippled, just noticeably. On many worlds, you say, he asked. Is there some problem you have with maintaining ownership of your shops? Navit frowned, as if trying to decipher his way through a complicated sentence, then let his face clear. Nah, you got it all wrong, he said. I'm not trying to set up a place I can settle down in. Besides, unless you got a bunch of guys to run the racks for you, you can't make a go of the exotic pet business unless you keep moving. A lot of potential stock... Um, sorry, lost my place. <laughs> a lot of potential stock you'll never even hear about unless you go where they come from. Perhaps, the Bothan murmured, but I suspect you will not find much of a market on Bothawui in these troubled times. You kidding, Navit said, letting some oily smugness show through. Hey, this place is perfect. A planet under siege, lots of tension. That's exactly where folks are going to need a pet to get their minds off their troubles. Trust me, I've seen it happen dozens of times. If you say so, the Botham said, with a ripple of his shoulder fur, obviously not caring whether this slightly uncouth alien made a profit here or not. Leave me your comlink frequency and code, and you'll be notified when the quarantine is ended. Thanks, Navit said, collecting his documents together. Make it fast, okay? It will be as quick as regulations require, the Botham said. A day of peace and profit to you. Yeah, same to you. Five minutes later, Navit was walking down the street, jostling his way through the mass of travelers hurrying in and out of the spaceport. Passing up the rows of for-hire land speeders, he put his back to the setting sun and headed off on foot towards a row of cheap hotels bordering the spaceport area. With his back to the sun, he spotted the shadow coming up behind him a few seconds before Cliff dropped him to step at his side. Any problems? The other asked quietly. No, it went real smooth, Navit said. You? Cliff shook his head. Not a one. He took the bribe, by the way, but he wouldn't promise we'd get the animals out any sooner. Not with a bribe that small, Navit agreed, smiling to himself. An insultingly small gratuity from the pet dealer's assistant, and not at all from the dealer himself, ought to nicely reinforce their carefully constructed image as small-timers trying to turn a fast profit without the slightest idea how the game was played. And with the Bothans, an image like that practically guaranteed them to be the focus of private amusement, backroom contempt, and complete official disinterest. Which meant that when the time was right for the Drevstar and section of the Bothawui planetary shield to come down, it would. You see Horvick or Penson in there? Cliff asked. I didn't spot either of them. No, but I'm sure they got in all right, Navit said. We can tap the rendezvous point tomorrow if we can find a shop fast enough. I picked up a rental listing, Cliff said. Most of them come with apartments above them. That'll be handy, Navit said. We'll look through it tonight and see if there's anything in the right area. If not, we can always check with a rental agent in the morning. Cliff chuckled. Don't worry, we got plenty of bribe money left. Yes, Navit murmured, looking around. Fifteen years ago, according to Ruber, it had been information from Bothan spies that had led the Rebel Alliance to Endor and resulted in the death of Emperor Palpatine and the destruction of the second Death Star. In the years since then, Bothans had been involved with the Black Sun Organization, the destruction of Mount Tantus, 
and any number of other blows against the Empire. He didn't know the full scope of the plan that was underway here, but of all the worlds Grand Admiral Thrawn might have chosen for destruction, few would have given him more personal satisfaction than this one. They had reached their chosen hotel now, and as they started up the steps, an ancient droid standing warden beside the door stirred himself. Good evening, good sirs, he wheezed. May I call for a baggage carrier? Nah, we can handle them, Nevitt said. No sense wasting good money on a droid. But sir, the service is free, the droid said, sounding confused. But by then, Nevitt and Cliff were past him, pushing through the doors and strolling into the lobby. They were, he noted, the only hotel guests carrying their own bags. But that was all right. Let the Bothans and their more sophisticated guests snicker at them behind their backs if they chose. When the fire began to rain from the sky, the laughter would turn to screams of terror, and Navit would be enjoying every minute of it. And that's the end of the chapter. Hope you enjoyed it. Talk to you soon.